We continue our study of the book of Exodus, and we are in Exodus 23. In the midst of Moses recording what God told him as far as the basic parameters of the covenant. Now, mind you, this is not the details of the law. The details of the law are going to be given further in Exodus and then also in Leviticus. So what we're seeing here are the general parameters. We've already seen the ten words that have been given, the ten commandments as we would call them. Now what follows after this, all the way up to about chapter uh, 24, is uh, the general parameters that go along with the ten words, the, that guiding principles, in other words. And, in, in, and also, what Moses is going to indicate is that the two tablets of stone that would be given to him by God on the, on the Mount Sinai does not only contain the Ten Commandments. The way he words it, as you're going to see, is that there's some more that's on those ten on those two tablets of stone, uh, and we'll talk about that once we get there. But chapter 23 begins, You shall not bear a false report. Do not join your hand with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. Now what uh, God is doing through Moses is indicating the law concerning judicial matters. We're talking now about things that have to do with courtroom appearances and the law concerning those kinds of things. Verse 2 says, New American Standard wording, You shall not follow the masses in doing evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after a multitude in order to pervert justice. Now, in context, he's talking about judicial things, about passing judgment, legal judgment. You will not follow the masses. Popular opinion does not determine the guilt or innocence of somebody in a court proceeding. King James says, thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil. That's what I'm used to hearing. And when I, when I think of scripture, when I memorize scripture, when I call, call it to mind, it's always in King James language because that's, that's the kind of version I used when I was memorizing. I love the way the King James translators render that verse. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. It just has a, a cadence to it and it has that kind of ring to it. And I'll never forget hearing sermons preached by my grandfather, my uncles, I've preached it over the years, based on that verse, thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil. And we know that that principle is true. It's a great principle. It is echoed in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Evil communications corrupt good morals. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. In other words, if you pile around with those kinds of folks that are wicked, it's going to rub off on you. Thou shalt not follow the multitude to do evil. We can't follow the majority in matters concerning spiritual things. That is to say that whatever the majority says must be the truth. That seems to be the guiding principle in the United States as far as whether or not a thing is right or wrong. Take a poll. What does Gallup have to say about it? What do the polling services have to say about the majority opinion? That doesn't matter about right or wrong. The majority could, could support uh, uh, killing those who are innocent completely. Oh, yeah, we got 61 million plus abortions, right? Do the majority of the United States support abortion on demand? You better believe it. Does that make it right? No, it doesn't. Well, the fact is, the majority oftentimes is wrong about morality. And in judicial matters especially, talking to judges, talking to those who are in a position to do something, he says, don't follow the masses. And then he says in verse 3, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his dispute. That's interesting. If you have some sort of dispute, some sort of legal question, and you've got somebody who is poor, and you show partiality to that poor person because of their circumstance, in spite of the facts of the case, is that doing justice? Well, no. He says, don't be partial to a poor man in his dispute. And now he says in verse 4, if you meet your enemy's ox 
or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him. You shall surely release it with him. Decency, common decency. This was a very common problem in this day and time. So when you see that happen, don't say, well, it's not my problem, it's his problem. You go and help that person. It didn't uh, Glenn Campbell sing something about like that, uh, try a little kindness back in the late 60s? Uh, if you see your brother standing by the road, you, you know the, the lyrics, you remember the song, those of you who are old enough. But the fact is, this kind of situation is, if you see this kind of situation happening, you go help that person. That's just common decency. But it also factors in to matters of the court. Because things like this quite often would come up in judicial disputes. So he says, you help out in these kind of situations. Then verse 6, the opposite of verse 3. You shall not pervert the justice due to your needy brother in his dispute. So in verse 3, he says, don't show partiality to the poor in some kind of judicial matter. But then he says, do not pervert the justice because of a needy brother. There are those judges who would look down upon those who are poor, down upon those who are in need, and pervert justice as a result. Would that be a problem in Israel later on? You better believe it. The prophets would cry out about the injustice that was shown by the judges toward the poor and the needy and the homeless and the widows and the orphans. And that's what God is trying to get across to not only Moses, but especially to the judges of Israel and to Israel itself. Then verse 5, or verse, uh, not verse 5, verse 7. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent or the righteous for I will not acquit the guilty. God is not a friend of injustice. God always is a friend to those who are innocent, to those who are righteous. And it would be the case that when the period of the kings would come along, where you had the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, the vast majority of those kings were evil kings, and the judges that were under them were perverted justices. They did not do true justice. They persecuted, even killed the innocent. They killed the righteous. We don't have that happening in the United States today, of course. Yes, we do. You know we do. And God still will not acquit the guilty. Yes, sir. Right. Yes. Samuel's sons uh, were not like, his, not like their father. Just like Eli's sons were not like Eli. Uh, it, that kind of uh, child rearing rubbed off on Samuel, Samuel apparently because his sons didn't turn out like he did. Uh, but yes, injustice. Not treating those who are innocent and those who are righteous in the right way. Verse 8. Again, all of this has to do with judicial matters. You shall not take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of the just. Bribes. Bribes, that has uh, plagued many a society as far as the judicial system, has it not? You may remember the TV show The Untouchables from the 1950s. I don't remember it. I've seen reruns. I do remember the movie that came out in 1987 with Kevin Costner, The Untouchables, one of my favorite movies of all time, by the way. And I well remember the time where one of Al Capone's men came into the office where uh, Elliot Ness, Kevin Costner's character, was in. And he came in with his trench coat and his hat, and he reached into his pocket and pulled out this little envelope and put it down on the desk and sort of grinned and chuckled a little bit. And Kevin Costner said, what is this? said, well, you know, and he knew what it was. It was a bribe. And he sent one of his men out to get some more men to come in and witness it. And he took that envelope and threw it at him and said, you tell your boss I'm not going to take this. 
So you consider yourself an untouchable, huh? And he said, yes, sir. And he pushed him out the door. He wasn't going to be bought. He wasn't going to be bribed. Well, that's the thing about bribery. It perverts justice. Immediately, it perverts justice. And that's what they couldn't do. But that's where Israel went. That's eventually where they were by the time the prophets came along. And that's the tragedy of this. What God had clearly said was ignored or was just completely set aside. Verse 9, you shall not oppress a stranger since you yourselves know the feelings of a stranger. For you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. You will not oppress a stranger. In context of the judicial system is what he's talking about. You won't oppress a stranger in the courts because you were where they are. You need to remember where you came from. Or as uh, uh, Ricky Skaggs used to sing, don't get above your raisin. That's what God is telling the Israelites. Don't get above your raisin. Remember where you came from. Verse 10, you shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow so that the needy of your people may eat and whatever they leave the beast of the field may eat. You are to do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. This is describing in a general way the Sabbath year. Every seven years they are to do this. It served a humanitarian purpose. It's for those who are needy and those who don't have much. It is to serve that purpose for them. And later on, as we're going to see in the book of Leviticus, he's going to describe the Sabbath year and all that's connected with it in much more detail, uh, which makes a lot of sense when you really look at it. And it would do well, we would do well to imitate it as far as society is concerned to a certain extent. Verse 12. Six days you are to do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest and the son of your female slave as well as your stranger may refresh themselves. Now concerning everything which I have said to you, be on your guard and do not mention the name of other gods nor let them be heard from your mouth. Don't mention the name of other gods. Don't even say their names. Don't talk about them like you are going to talk about the God of heaven. And unfortunately, Israel's history later on, when you get to the period of the judges and especially the period of the kings, would be marked by idolatry and worshiping other gods. Verse 14, three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. This is the Passover feast. Now remember, this is general parameters. He's not describing the details yet. He's just telling telling all of them the general parameters of the thing. The feast of unleavened bread is a pilgrim feast, by the way. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt." and none shall appear before me empty-handed. That's implying later on in the sanctuary, first in the tabernacle and then later on in the temple. Also you shall observe the feast of the harvest of the first fruits of your labors from what you sow in the field. That's the day of Pentecost as we're going to see later on. Also the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year, That's the Feast of Tabernacles. When you gather in the fruits of your labors from the field, three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. So three times all the males in the land of Israel are to appear before God. These three feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, three major feasts they are to keep. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread nor is the fat of my feast to remain overnight until morning. He's talking about the Passover. In connection with the Passover, no leavened bread. No leaven, no fat remaining overnight. And so they are to follow that. That's how we know in part that when the Lord would institute his supper with the apostles the night before he died, we know that the bread that was taken on that night was unleavened bread. 
because it was a connection with the Feast of Passover. So the artos, that's the Greek word for bread, artos means unleavened bread in that context because that's what they're keeping. Yes, sir. Yes, I, I agree. I agree with that. Uh, there are brethren that say you can use you can use fermented or, and a wine as well as unfermented. And I've, I've got a problem with that for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which is what you say about ferment, uh, be using ferment. Uh, but still, the fact is, uh, the, the bread that they were to use was to be unleavened. And uh, they were to keep that feast in that way. So he says, verse 19, you shall bring the choice first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. The choice, the best. They're to offer the best of everything. And then he says, you are not to boil a young goat in the milk of its mother. What does that have to do with the price of milk in China, right? You think, in your mind? That's referring to a common Canaan, Canaanite fertility rite associated with idol worship. They would take a young kid, a young goat, live goat, and they would boil it alive in the milk of its mother. Horrible. That was associated with paganism. Pagan fertility rites. God says absolutely no. Do not do that. Verse 20. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Okay, he says he's going to send an angel. He's going to send an angel. But notice the next verse. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Okay, so he says, I'll send an angel. But they are to obey the voice of this angel in everything. Is there anywhere else in the entire Bible that people are told to obey an angel? Absolutely not. In fact, just the opposite. Yes, sir. Right, right. So is this an angel as we understand the regular angels of the Bible described, or is this something or someone more than an angel? I would argue it's more than just an angel. Somebody says, well, it's the angel of the Lord. Okay, all right, let's say that. But then notice what he says. Obey his voice. Not only obey his voice, and he says, do not be rebellious toward him. Now that contradicts, it seems, what uh, Paul writes in Galatians 1. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, and that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And then also what John would write in Revelation, when he was going to bow down before the angel, and the angel says, see you do it not. He goes on to admonish him, worship God. So everywhere in Scripture we are told not to worship angels, not to follow angels, and yet here God says, obey him in all that he says and don't be rebellious to him. And on top of that he says, my name is in him. It is my conviction. This is my conviction. I can't prove it 100%. This is my conviction that this is describing the preexistent Christ, the second person of the Godhead. Who else could it be describing? God's name is in him. They are to obey his voice and everything he says and not be rebellious toward him. And by the way, he's going to be before them all the way into the land of Canaan. And by the way, also he says, if you obey his voice and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. I think this is the preexistent Christ. One of those instances in the Old Testament or one of them being when Jacob wrestled with the angel and it goes on to indicate that he had seen God 
or have wrestled with God. And other places in the New Testament where indicates perhaps it was the second person of the Godhead, the pre-existent Christ. Not Jesus, because that body was prepared specifically for him when he came into the earth, into the earth uh, born of the virgin, to become Jesus Christ. We're talking about the pre-existent, the second person of the Godhead. This is who was before Israel all the way into Canaan. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, for that rock was Christ. The second person of the Godhead was with them all the way in. And even all the time that they were in the land of Canaan, all the way until Ezekiel describes the, the presence of God being taken up from the temple and moving out. Christ is there. So he goes on to say, verse 23, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I will completely destroy them. This is not the last time we will see all these names mentioned. These are the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. And uh, for many, many years, skeptics of the Bible, not right deniers of the Bible, would say that uh, the Bible is not true in part because the Hittites never existed. Hittite kingdom never was there. But then in the late 1800s, archaeological discoveries showed that there was indeed a, Canaan, a Hittite kingdom, proving that the Bible was correct all along. So all of these different nationalities were already inhabitants of the land of Canaan. And the more we find out about their religious practices, specifically Canaanite religion, the more it becomes obvious, at least to me, of why God said wipe them out. You know, a lot of times brethren and people that want to believe the Bible have a problem with God saying go in and utterly destroy all of the inhabitants of the land. Wipe them out. Don't let one person live. And we recoil from that. God is saying to massacre all these people. That, that's genocide, isn't it? Well, when you look at the Canaanite religion and all of the paganism that was already in place, solidly in place in Canaan, you can quite understand why God said, wipe them out. Because if they were allowed to thrive and prosper, there would be no way at all for the Messiah to be born. Because that was so entrenched, it was so a part of Canaan at this point, that it was going to take only God coming in and destroying that entire population to get it ended, to get it over with. Uh, the more we find out about their practices, the more we recoil from it. And I won't go into detail, I just, just trust me. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty horrendous. Uh, okay, so verse 24. In connection with these Canaanite and, uh, and these all these Gentile tribes, he says, you shall not worship their gods nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds. But you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces. That's what God tells them to do. You're not going to have anything to do with their religion. You're not going to have anything to do with their gods. And God says, you're going to come in and you're going to wipe it out. Completely eradicate it. The supreme tragedy is that Israel did not follow God's will in that. Idolatry and idol worship and paganism would be a thorn in the side of Israel almost from the time that they entered into the land of Canaan until the time that uh, first Assyria came and took away the northern kingdom and then Babylon would come in and sweep out the southern kingdom. That was the besetting sin of Israel and Judah because they did not wipe out Canaanite religion and pagan religion and all the gods and goddesses. In fact, the more archaeological digs are unearthing there in Israel, the more we are finding in Israelite households small deities, small household deities that you could put on the mantle. If, you had, if they had a fireplace, they put this household deity on the mantle of their living room if they had one. In other words, they had their own house deity. And they still claim to worship God. And we think, think, how could they do that? Well, they did. Again, I refer you to Ezekiel, 
where Ezekiel is taken in the spirit by God all the way into Jerusalem and God shows him what's going on at the temple and God is saying in effect, are you seeing this? Do you see what they're doing? Do you just, just look at this. Just look at this, what they're doing. And the priests of God are holding the branch to their nose in the direction of the sun and you have women weeping over Tammuz, a Canaanite god. And inside the temple, you have images on the walls of the inside of the temple to deities, pagan gods. That's how far gone they were by the time Ezekiel writes what he does. That was the last straw. God has put up with it, and he's not going to put up with it anymore. Well, this right here that we're reading is what God intended for them to do, but what they did not. Now, if Josiah had lived and not had been killed in war uh, as he was, I think Josiah could have by himself gotten rid of all the idolatry of Judah. He was on his way to doing it. Josiah went so far as to go into the graveyards of the old apostates of Israel and desecrate their graves because he was making it clear to Israel and to Judah, we're not having this anymore. And we're not going to laud the memories of all those apostates that led us astray. We have gone away from the word of God. We're coming back to it. But before he could fulfill and completely finish the job, he was killed in warfare. But this is what God wanted originally. Verse 25, but you shall serve the Lord your God. Literally, you shall serve Yahweh your Elohim. Yahweh being the unpronounceable name of God, Elohim referring to any God, but specifically here, God of heaven. Yahweh your Elohim, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Now all of this is contingent upon their obedience. If you obey me in these matters, I'll remove sickness and disease. There will be no miscarriages. All will be well. The implication is that the opposite is true as well. If you don't obey me, all of this is going to plague you. Verse 27, I will send my terror ahead of you and throw into confusion all the people among whom you come and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. I will send my terror the fear of the Lord is going to be sent before. Yes, Lamont. Yes. Yes. And by the time you come to Deuteronomy, boy, we eventually get to Deuteronomy down the road. It's going to be even more explicit. God is going to be far more explicit in spelling out as you're talking about. If you obey my voice, this will happen. If you turn away from my voice, this will happen. And guess what? It happened exactly as God said it would. Exactly. He's going to be up front. God's going to be up front with you the whole time. He's going to say, well, this is going to happen if you obey me. This is going to happen if you disobey me. So by the time the prophets come around and Israel thinks they're doing well and the prophets declare, no, you're not because you're not treating the poor and those who are needy in the right way and you're perverting justice and you're worshiping idol gods and you're turning away from the law of God and they're saying, what? Well, the prophets say, that's what God said. God said it and you're not following it. God is always going to be up front with us. He's not going to keep us in the dark. And he didn't keep Israel in the dark either. He's very clear about it. This terror that God sends ahead of them in battle is something, I believe, connected with the holiness of God. Remember the parameters, the boundaries that were set up on Mount Sinai so the people could not come in lest they die because of God's uh, holiness? There was something in connection with the holiness and the radiance of God that was lethal to those who were not. 
I believe this fear of the Lord, this terror of the Lord is connected completely with the holiness and the radiance of God. Notice, I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites before you. Hornets. Is this literal hornets? Could be. Most likely, however, it's some sort of a figurative word that God uses to describe something that he is sending out before them. It could be literal hornets, but it could be something else that we can't really describe that God could not really get across the Israelites without using this kind of word that would plague those Canaanite tribes. Something that would be an added emphasis to driving them out. God's going to be with them the whole way. God's going to take care of this. He's got this, in other words. I will not drive them out before you in a single year, that the land may not become desolate and the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. God is going to allow time for the Israelites to settle in the land and to grow and become strong. I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you will drive them out before you. So he sets the boundaries. He sets the boundaries of this. Uh, the limits were only realized that he describes here, these limitations, these boundaries, were only realized for a brief period under Solomon. Many, many centuries later, when you come to 1 Kings chapter 4, because of Israel's disobedience to God, they weren't allowed to fully realize this until Solomon becomes king, and it was not for long. Then verse uh, 32 you shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. You shall make no covenant with them. That is, you will not make an agreement with them or with their gods. Now, tragically, as wise as Solomon was, as prosperous as Solomon was, we also know that he married 700 wives and 300 concubines. 1,000 women. How in the world could he get ready for worship at the temple on Saturday? Well, anyway, that's what my dad always would say. You know, it was tough enough for me and him when me, my mom and my sister were in the house and we had just two restrooms and having to get ready for church on Sunday morning. Think about it. Thou well, anyway, that's, I, I'm being silly. Fact is, 700 wives and 300 concubines, many of those marriages, many of those arranged relationships were for political purposes. And the Bible clearly says that these women turn his heart away from God to other gods. We know from history that one of those pagan gods was possibly the goddess Astarte. The goddess Astarte was the goddess of sex and the perversion of sex. I fully believe that that was one of the gods that Solomon's heart was turned away to. And I've often wondered is the goddess Astarte the goddess of the United States? You've got to wonder. You've got to wonder. But here he says, don't make any covenant with these Gentile nations and, or he says, with their gods. Verse 33, they shall not live in your land because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. The reason for the absoluteness of God's command to Israel to drive out, eradicate the Canaanites is given right here in this verse. Yes, sir. There you go. <laughs> Right. Oh, yes. Uh, that principle still holds true today. Uh, have no fellowship. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Yet how many do we know who have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness and do not reprove them? 
Well, that's one reason why we're in the shape that we're in, the United States, isn't it? That's one reason why the church is in such a shape in so many places. It's because we're not speaking out enough. I'm not talking about being ugly. I'm not talking about being, being uh, ornery about things. I'm just talking about speaking the truth. Speaking the truth for what it is. About matters of morality, yes. About matters of sexuality, yes. About matters of how we treat one another, absolutely. All things we've got to speak out and make sure we speak the truth. Israel failed to follow this command. They failed to follow it in its fullness. And as God predicted, not only here, but he's going to predict several more times before he's through, the practice of idolatry and the presence of idolatrous peoples in their midst led Israel away. That's the reason why the Assyrians came in and swept out the northern kingdom. That's the reason why the Babylonians will later come in and sweep out the southern kingdom is because of idolatry. As Brother Rex Turner often put it in his classes that I sat in many, many years ago, he said that Babylon was the boiling cauldron to burn out the sin of idolatry. That is the Babylonian captivity. That was the boiling cauldron to burn out that sin. By the time the Israelites came back in the returning back to the land of Canaan or the land of Israel, that idolatrous problem was no more an issue. <laughs> no more. They didn't have problems with idolatry anymore. It had been burned out of them. They were sick of it. Finally were sick of it. The remnant would return and they would not have any issue at all with idolatry and idolatrous practices. But tragically, their forebears had a big time issue with it. Any questions or comments before we get into chapter 24? We've only got a few minutes left. All right. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord. But they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. What's interesting here, and uh, Randall Bailey put, points this out, and I'm not going to go through it in, in the commentary, but I'm just going to point it out to you. There is a parallel here in Genesis, uh, Exodus 24 with Genesis 22. If you look at Abraham and Isaac going up to the mountain where Abraham is going to offer up Isaac as an offering, you look at that entire sequence of, of uh, Genesis 22 and compare it with Exodus 24 in this sequence, and it's very much similar. And he spells out how many in the, in the Hebrew text especially, how similar it is. I'd never thought of that before I read that, what he said in his commentary. And again, I highly recommend that to you if you get a chance to get it and to study uh, it as you're studying Exodus. But notice it's, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, which is, by the way, the sons of Aaron. We will come across their names later. You're familiar with Nadab and Abihu in a negative sense. At this point, it's still positive. Seventy of the elders of Israel. Seventy elders. Why? Likely because they are the ones to, ju to execute justice in judicial matters. They're the leaders of Israel along with Moses. And you shall worship at a distance. Now, why is all this being done? Because there's got to be some sort of ceremony that will, uh, that will lock down this covenant with Israel where the people will agree to follow it. God is saying, I'm going to be in covenant with you and now the people must agree for this covenant to be binding. And that's what all this is leading up to. <clears throat> then he says in verse 3, Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's tragic. The reason why I say it's tragic is because it's not going to be long before we see these very people turning their backs on God. They had just said, all that God has said, we will do. And then it's not long until what are they doing? Many of them are going against God. <coughs> Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. 
Notice, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. It wasn't Moses and a number of editors and redactors over a period of hundreds of years. It wasn't Moses, quote unquote, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It was actually Israel that was doing this. No, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Now either he says that and it's true or he's telling a falsehood. Yes, sir. Yes. He was the one person who was qualified to do this. If you want to talk about qualifications, Moses had the qualifications. He was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, which would include how to write down legal matters. He'd know how to write down a law code. He'd know about covenants and agreements between two parties, especially a party that's greater than the other one. He knew about all this. He's the only one that could do this and do it correctly. And by the way, the Holy Spirit's inspiring him to do it. That's going to ensure it gets done correct. So he wrote down all the words of the Lord. <clears throat> then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men to the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. They're getting ready for this covenant ceremony. And then beginning with verse 7, or verse 6, <clears throat> Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. <clears throat> and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. The Hebrews writer will talk about this to some extent in Hebrews chapter 9 because he says that first covenant was dedicated with blood. And he goes on to talk about this. Now what happened? What, what Moses does is he takes this hyssop and he has a basin, as is described here, part water, part blood, the water to diffuse the blood. He puts the hyssop in there and then he sprinkles the book of the covenant with it ceremonially. Then he takes that hyssop and he does this in the direction of the people. That is, he doesn't go to each individual Israelite and sprinkle them with blood. He's doing this to the Israelites and possibly doing it over and over and over to make it clear what he's doing. He's sprinkling the blood of the covenant to the people. This is sealing the agreement, in other words. Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made you in accordance with all these words. Not only in Hebrews 9, 19 and 20, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five 25 also talks about this. Blood in connection with the covenant. I never will forget Rex Turner Sr. talking about the importance of blood in the Bible. All the way from the beginning to the end. Blood sacrifice, bloody sacrifices is a part and parcel of everything that God writes about. And this in particular, the blood. The blood of the covenant seals it with them. And when they say everything that God says we will do, when you look at what happens not long from now, you will see that as being a tragic statement indeed. Well, this is where we will stop. And we will take up with our lesson 